afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk at this meeting. Even if I'm working in the San Fernando in San Diego, I'm actually from Madrid, so <coughs> it's great for me to be home. So I'm going to talk about the work we do in the lab. We focus on a peptide called IRGD, and it's a tumor penetrating peptide uh, for tumor specific drug delivery. So current problems in cancer treatment are that some drugs are affecting not only cancer cells, but also healthy cells in the body, leading to very toxic side effects. So there is need for specific delivery of these drugs into the tumor. Then a uh, poor penetration of drugs into the tumor is another uh, problem, and this affects the efficacy of the drug. And then the last uh, problem is metastasis. So there is need to prevent metastasis from happening. Uh, tumor penetrating peptide IRGD was discovered in the laboratory while doing a screening by phage display uh, for peptides that could recognize tumor vasculature in a prostate cancer model. With the RGD motif, IRGD can bind the integrins alpha B beta 3 and alpha B beta 5 present exclusively in tumor vasculature, but then it contains also a sender motif, and a sender motif is either arginine or lysine, then two random amino acids, and another arginine or lysine at the end. And it's important that the C terminal is an arginine or a lysine. And this motif actually is the one that mediates cell penetration through the neurotilin 1 receptor. The sender motif in the IRGD is only exposed after cleavage of the peptide by a cell surface protease that is present in the tumor environment. And then <coughs> the interaction of the sender motif with neurotilin 1 induces actually vascular permeability and um, this we call it the bystander effect, and I'll explain a little bit more after that. So here's a cartoon about uh, IRGD's mechanism of penetration. We can see how the RGD motif binds to the alpha B integrins, and um, <coughs> the protease cleaves here, leading to the C-terminal arginine, and um, the disulfide bond we know is broken in, in, um, in vivo, and then releases two peptides, the CDPG, and then the sender active peptide. And one can attach a cargo to this uh, cysteine. You can either attach a fluorescent protein to track where the peptide goes, or actually uh, drugs can be uh, conjugated to the peptide. Also, um, we have also investigated what I sh uh, talked about before about the vascular permeability in which um, drugs that are not attached to um, the cysteine just the administered will take advantage of the neuropilin 1 uh, perme vascular permeabilization and cell permeabilization and will also get into the tumor. So I'll show it now with some experiments. So the, overv the overview of the presentation, I'm going to show how IRGD can specifically home to tumors and penetrate deep into tumor tissue, how it can carry drugs uh, either conjugated or co-administered uh, to the tumor, and uh, we've done two different routes of administration, systemic and intraperitoneal. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how IR IRGD can prevent metastasis. So for the tumor homing experiments, we've done a number of uh, cancer models, but here I'll describe some of the breast cancer models, uh, prostate cancer, or um, genetically engineered mice, the KTC mice for pancreatic cancer. And what we do is we do intravenous injection of FAM-labeled IRGD, uh, we let it circulate for one hour or two hours, depending on the experiment, and then we examine the organs under UV illumination. And we can also do immunofluorescence of the tissue sections. For the treatment studies, we do IV injection of IRGD, either conjugated or co-administered uh, with uh, drugs. And for different types of drugs, we have tested small molecules like doxorubicin, nanoparticle drugs like abraxane, and uh, monoclonal antibodies like uh, trastuzumab. Then we evaluate the amount of drug in the tumor and other tissues, and also uh, to see the efficacy of the treatment, we do either tumor weight or tumor volume. So here in the panel A uh, is a homing experiment where we have injected IV IRGD and let it circulate for an hour. This is a pancreatic cancer model, so we can see here in the pancreas the tumor showing green for IRGD while the other organs uh, don't have any fluorescence. The kidney has uh, a little bit of fluorescence, but that's because IRGD gets uh, excreted by the urine after a while. So if we look at immunofluorescence sections of these uh, tumors, 
we can see how IRGD spreads very well into the tumor tissue. And uh, a controlled peptide that has the RGD motif but does not have the Sendar motif is able also to home to tumor vasculature. So we can see here there's a co-staining with blood vessels. We can see here it's homing to the vasculature but it's not spreading through the tumor tissue. And here we have the quantification of the IRGD uh, fluorescence in the tissue compared to the controlled peptide. Uh, now if we try to conjugate a drug to IRGD, in this case it's Abraxen, we have either conjugated Abraxen to IRGD or to the controlled peptide CRGDC and looked for the accumulation of Abraxen uh, in the tumor and other tissues. So this graph represents uh, the fold over Abraxen alone, fold accumulation over Abraxen alone, and we can see how IRGD very significantly increases the accumulation of this drug in the tumor, but not in the other organs. And then when we look at the treatment study, this is a prostate cancer model, we can see that Abraxan alone was not very effective. It w it's almost comparable to the TBS control or peptide alone. But when we put the conjugation of Abraxan with uh, IRGD, there's a very significant reduction in the tumor weight. Then next we wanted to examine the bystander effect and uh, we first started by co-administering IRGD with the Evans Lu dye and see if we could see uh, the extravasation of Evans Lu into the tumor. <coughs> so here we have, this is again a pancreatic tumor, so we can see the Evans Lu dye in the tumor and also in the kidney there's a metastatic nodule there, it can also reach all the metastatic uh, lesions in the rest of the organs. But apart from these, the other organs don't have any Evans Lu. And uh, this was um, correlating with the concentration of IRGD injected. So if we have uh, 30 nanomole, 100 or 300, then there is higher and higher accumulation of Evans Lu, but only in the tumor, not in the rest of the tissue. And uh, this effect is um, dependent on the Sendar motif and the neuropilin one, because when we block neuropilin one with a blocking <coughs> antibody, we can see in this yellow line, the, compared to the IgG uh, control, there is no more effect of accumulation of Evans Lu in the tissue. So next we wanted to test the drugs. So in this case, we first tested Abraxan in a model of BT474 breast tumor. Uh, we compared Abraxan alone versus Abraxan and IRGD conjugate or the free drug co-administered with IRGD. And we could see how the tumor uh, the tumor concentration of Abraxan was greatly increased by either conjugating or just co-administering IRGD. But this didn't happen in the other organs. Then uh, when we do the treatment, this is measuring tumor volume. We can see that Abraxan and TBS control didn't have any significant difference. However, when we treated with the combination of IRGD conjugation or um, co-administration, we have a very significant decrease in the tumor volume. And if we look at the immunofluorescence sections of these tumors, we can see that Abraxan alone doesn't really reach the tumor parenchyma, while the combination or um, conjugation with IRGD really increases the amount of Abraxan in the tumor. We next uh, examined uh, a small molecule like doxorubicin in a prostate cancer model. So in panel A, we can see how there's very little free doxorubicin that accumulates in the tumor tissue, but when we co-administer with IRGD, we can see a very big increase. And here's the quantification of this uh, in the tumor versus the other organs. Then <coughs> we wanted to examine also um, what happens to the tumor weight once we treat animals with uh, the combination of IRGD and doxorubicin. We examined two doses, one milligram per kilogram or three milligrams per, per kilogram. And we can see that in combination with IRGD, the tumor uh, weight was significantly reduced and it was even as effective as the three milligram per kilogram dose of doxorubicin alone. So this means that one can reduce threefold the amount of uh, drug that you're putting and get the same effect. So a big worry about also doxorubicin toxicity is the cardiomyocyte toxicity. So we looked at tunnel positive cells in the heart versus the tumor. So in black bars are the tumors and we can see 
that when you have IRGV um, co-administered with oxorubicin, there is a higher amount of uh, cell death in the tumor as expected, but it doesn't increase the toxicity in the, in the heart. But when we look at the toxicity in the heart between the two doses, one milligram per kilogram versus three, it's a significant increase. So if one can use the lower dose, this is really beneficial. And then lastly, we wanted to check the co-administration of a monoclonal antibody, such as trastuzumab in a BT474 breast tumor model. So we can see here in a immunohistochemistry staining of the tumor tissue, how trastuzumab administration alone doesn't show a lot of accumulation in the tumor, but when we co-administer with IRGV, this uh, concentration increases a lot. Then if we look at the tumor tissue compared to the other organs, the other organs almost don't have any um, trastuzumab accumulation, but almost 40-fold increase in the, in the tumor. And uh, we did a treatment study, and here we also did two doses, nine, three milligrams per kilogram and nine. So if you look at PBS or peptide alone, they don't show any significant difference when you treat with the trastuzumab at the two different doses. However, when we treat with combination with IRGV, there is already significant decrease in tumor volume with uh, three milligrams per kilogram, but the effect on the nine, uh, on the higher dose was even better. And this actually did cure the mice and uh, we continued to observe them for the following two weeks and there was no relapse. So next we wanted to check, will IRGV work in the case of peritoneal cancers? So <coughs> in systemic administ systemically administered drugs partially enter the peritoneal fluid, but the concentration sometimes is too low to have a significant effect. And also some of the peritoneal uh, metastases actually are not uh, vascularized. So also systemic administration will not do anything for these uh, lesions. <coughs> so then we decided to test the IRGD tumor penetration and co-administration of doxorubicin by intraperitoneal injection. The models we used were MKN45P of gastric cancer or LOVO6 colon cancer and um, in these cases, now we don't have uh, the vascular administration and uh, um, we looked for the expression of the integrins, alpha, B, beta 3 and beta 5 and neuropilin 1 receptor in these tumor cells and they do highly express um, both of them. And uh, lastly, I'll talk about uh, also, we also uh, tested IRGD penetration into human metastasis uh, extents. So in this uh, first panel, we have an IP injection of FAM labeled IRGV, and we, we can see uh, that it nicely targets the tumors. Uh, here we also wanted to exclude the possibility that if you inject IP, some of it might get into the circulation and go back into the tumor that way. So for this reason, we also inoculated subcutaneous tumors into these mice to see if this effect was circulation dependent or not. So in the IP route of injection, subcutaneous tumor got almost no fluorescence, meaning that this was circulation independent. However, when we compare this with the IV route of injection, the subcutaneous tumor got a lot of IRGV fluorescence and also the other tumors. Um, we also uh, wanted to check uh, in the IP injection what happens to the avascular tumors. So we can see how the IRGV found is uh, very present in avascular or vascularized tumors, but not in the subcutaneous tumors. And in IV injection, we observed the opposite. There was no, um, no IRGV present in the avascular tumors, but it was present in the vascularized or subcutaneous tumors. So next we wanted to check the bystander effect in this model, and in this case we used uh, red dextran co-injected with uh, IRGV. <coughs> So uh, again, here in the IP injection route, we see nice accumulation of dextran in the, uh, in the tumors, peritoneal tumors, but not in the subcutaneous tumor. And when we did IV injection, nice accumulation in the subcutaneous tumor and also in the peritoneal one. Again, here we look for the avascular tumors in the IP injection and we could see a nice um, accumulation of, uh, of uh, the dextran that co-injected with IRGV, but not in the IV route. And subcutaneous tumors, 
like we saw in the IP, there is no dextran, and in the IV we can see a nice amount of dextran. So now we decided to test the co-injection of IRGD and doxorubicin. So we used uh, for this experiment the MKN45, and <coughs> we can see here the concentration of doxorubicin is greatly increased in the tumor by co-injection of IRGD. And then when we looked at the tumor weight, there was a significant reduction in tumor weight compared to doxorubicin alone. Then we, we were able to obtain surgical uh, human metastasis explants of appendicellal, colon, and ovarian cancer. And what we did was uh, incubated them in a solution that contained PAM IRGD and G7 phage nanoparticles labeled in red. So we also tested some control peptides, CRGDC and um, IRGDD, that they both combine the integrins but don't have any Sendar motif. And we saw that it was only in the case of IRGD that both the FAM IRGD and the phage nanoparticles could penetrate into these um, samples. So this was very important because this, this means that it can be applied to, to human tumors. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how IRGD can inhibit spontaneous metastasis. We did a um, treatment of IRGD in two models of spontaneous metastasis. One was PC3, a human prostate cancer, and these cells are GFP labeled. And then the other model is LNP, mouse pancreatic cancer cells, and they are M-cherry labeled. And then we also looked for the meta mechanism of metastatic inhibition. We wanted to see if it was dependent on the RGD motif or the sender motif. And then we looked at what were the effects on cell attachment and cell migration. So here in panel A is a flow cytometry showing how these PC3 cells express the receptors of IRGD, neuropilin 1, and the integrins, alpha beta 3 is very low, but alpha beta 5 is uh, very high, highly expressed. So these are mice treated either with PBS, IRGD, or uh, other IRGD uh, or other RGD peptides that don't have sender motif. So we can see in the PBS control, the primary tumor in green and the metastatic nodules in, um, in, in green too. But when there is IRGD treatment, there is uh, no metastasis. Then we compare it to the other RGD um, binding peptides, but they didn't inhibit metastasis. So this seems to be dependent on the sender motif. Uh, this is the quantification here, and then we also quantify primary tumor weight, and we observed a slight decrease in primary tumor weight in IRGD-treated mice, but this is not significant, and this is consistent with other previous results. Then we looked at the model of the LNP cells, now in cherry, and with the PBS we can see the primary tumor and then all the metastasis, and IRGD can totally inhibit metastasis, and INGR is another peptide that is no, uh, not an RGD peptide, but it actually has a sender motif, and this one could inhibit also the metastasis, but not the other RGD uh, peptides. And the same uh, effect we saw in primary tumor weight here, there was not um, any significant decrease. But it did, um, both sender peptides really inhibited metastasis. So now we looked at what happened to cell attachment and migration. Here is the LMP cell attachment study, and we can see how uh, IRGD in different doses, you know, in increasing doses, it increasingly inhibits cell attachment. Then uh, we look at other sender peptides, like these three peptides, and they also inhibit the cell attachment. But when we disrupt the sender motif in this uh, RPARPAR peptide, then the cell attachment goes back to normal. And if we inhibit with neuropilin-1 antibody, it also uh, goes back to normal. And then we looked at what happens to cell migration. So we can see that IRGD, but not CRGDC, affected cell migration. And this was also dependent on neuropilin-1, because when we blocked with increasing concentrations of blocking antibody, the effect was uh, reversed. So in summary, I've shown that IRGD specifically targets tumors and penetrates deep into tumor parenchyma. IRGD drug conjugation or co-administration increases therapeutic efficacy. IRGD, I haven't talked about this, but it can also be used for tumor imaging. We have coupled IRGD to iron oxide nanoworms for MRI. And um, IRGD can be used for the treatment of peritoneal tumors also by active injection, and it can prevent sp spontaneous metastasis. 
So at the moment, we're trying to raise money to be able to do the toxicology studies. And if everything uh, goes well, we're hoping to bring it to clinical trials. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> <Good> acknowledgements. <laughs> So I would like to thank my mentor, Kazuki Sugahara. Uh, most of this work was done by him and uh, Tambet Tesalu in Eric Hebrews Lattice Lab. And then Gary Brown, Pablo Scoder, and myself have contributed to part of this work. And we also have to thank our collaborator, Andrew Lowy from the UCSD Morris Cancer Center that is providing us with the patient samples. And thank you for your attention. Any question for Dr. Mendoza? Congratulations, very fantastic results have you present. Thank you. Um, my question is related with the conjugate and the uh, co-administration of the peptide. Why do you think, uh, which is the explanation, why is mm, best, is the best result uh, have obtained with the um, co-administration of the peptide? So yeah, we have, we have compared most of the times conjugation to co-administration. So sometimes we have obtained like two to threefold higher uh, effects with the co-administration. And actually it's a better route of, uh, of uh, therapy because some of the conjugated drugs lose their activity when you conjugate them. So this way you have the free drug already and it can do its job. And the way the, way the, the bystander effect works is um, neuropilin one usually binds, for example, VGF-165 or semaphorins, and those are known to induce vascular and tissue permeability anyway. And they have a sender motif also. These, these, two, peptides have, uh, these two molecules have sender motifs. So then now IRGD sender motif is acting as if it was a semaphorin or VGF-165 and inducing the same effect and carrying along whatever you are co-injecting uh, to the tumor. So, uh, this bystander effect, uh, can you try as well cocktails of different uh, drugs? Because uh, you have tried only one, so have you tried cocktails? Yeah, we, yeah, no, I think we haven't tried that yet. We've tested, we've tested one, yeah. Drugs, one, but sometimes we do at the same time, for example, like uh, phage nanoparticles and a drug or, but drugs, I think we've tested only one for the moment. I have a question regarding the, your the accumulation. You compared the accumulation of free doxorubicin with, uh, and in the presence of RGD, or conjugated, I, I'm not quite sure now. And you express your numbers as you have a sevenfold increase, approximately a sevenfold increase of over free doxorubicin. Now, assuming that the accumulation of free doxorubicin is very, very, very small, maybe 0.1%, when a sevenfold increase is 0.7 percent, right? <laughs> well, the so that means the I mean your graph looks really impressive. No, but the so my, my, my question is okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> my question is, uh, what is the accumulation of your RGD doxorubicin in percentage of the total injected dose? Which I would like to remind, I mentioned it earlier, dox a doxil, the liposomal drug. Uh, it's approximately between five and eight percent of the total dose. So where are you lying with your RGD approach? Let me go back to the activities. This one. So all the graphs are expressed in fold over a doxorubicin accumulation. So here, doxorubicin alone, free dox is normalized to one. So then it's sevenfold. Yeah, you're, you're, you're okay. But if you, if it, the total percent of accumulation of a drug is maybe 0.1% of an in injected dose, okay? 
you, you can normalize to one, and then you have an eightfold increase. That means the total inject, the total accumulated dose of the RGD derivative is still just 0.8 percent of the injected dose. Do you, you told me you have five minutes. I was maybe uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to give you a hard time. Oh okay. no, no, no! Don't worry. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you very much.